Hey, this is Morgan from Seven Dust, and you're watching Good Company. Good Company! Hey guys, my name's Scott Bowling, and you're watching Good Company. Today, I have one of my all-time favorite drummers, Mr. Morgan Rose from Seven Dust. Today, we're going to talk about the history of Seven Dust. We're going to talk about before Seven Dust, when he was in Snake Nation, and even when you were a kid. So we're just going to go all the way back. Oof. We also have some fan questions. And we're also going to talk about uh, drum clinic stuff that you're working on. I think that's a rumor, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's happening. Thank you for being here, man. Thanks for having me, man. Finally. Yeah, man. That's how I just <laughs> got just got to see you play home in its entirety. So, what was that like playing? Uh, I mean, we hadn't played most of those songs in 20 years. So, and then we had like a few hours of rehearsal to learn them and the guys Just you know they can kind of sit at the house you know grab an acoustic or grab a guitar you know and do it with and can you know sing in the shower <laughs> and do his thing and i'm sitting here trying to like do this and figure it out i'm like man i don't know how to play these songs <laughs> but uh it, it went over much better than i thought it would when you guys did your first album um self-titled i know you guys did uh, one show in atlanta then later on you did some more added on will you guys do that with home you think or is that i just actually heard that we might do it mm -hmm. like it was there was no thought of doing that it was like we're just going to do it this one time but that's kind of how the first record that idea came about it was like we'll do it in atlanta and then that'll be that um i mean we don't love those records anymore we barely play you know we play a few songs over the last 20 plus years you know off both those records so but then we went back and did the first record i was like man that was a lot of fun you mm -hmm. know and and easier <laughs> i mean it's a lot easier than as we got older and tried challenging ourselves a little bit more is there any songs out of that album that you're gonna play in the future now and add to your set yeah like we're getting ready to go out on this run uh that we're doing with tremani uh starts february 1st i think um and we don't have any rehearsals for it like we're gonna go and play ship rock be, uh, prior to that and then uh i was just talking to my manager i'm like are we rehearsing for this tour <laughs> or is this typical seven dust you know we'll figure it out dude you know we'll, we'll go up and sound check it's like sound check lasts like 30 minutes we got an hour and 30 to kill so <laughs> but uh we did learn basically 40 songs in three days and and people might say, well, they're your songs. It's like I hadn't listened to those songs in 20 years, you yeah. know. But uh, but now we kind of know those, so we'll probably integrate some of the second record into the tour. Awesome, yeah. man! When you guys do like animosity from start to finish, that's gonna yeah. happen. Yeah, that, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, we'll definitely. I'm I'm sure we'll do that. I love how you do your drum heads, like for the albums. You yeah. Know? So those are like hard to find. <laughs> yeah. Or you have to be online when they go on auction because yeah. I missed a couple of days. It's like, oh, sold out. I'll get you whatever you want. I, I know that. I know, I know a guy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I want to go back, but before Snake Nation and all that, when did you start playing drums? I mean, I, uh, how I old mean, were you? My, my nana bought me a drum set from like Sears when I was probably four or five years old. And, uh, my dad was playing guitar. We were living up north, and um, he played guitar and, like, immediately was like trying to teach me how to play Hendrix songs and stuff like that. So the the story goes that me and him even argue about this. Like, I would remember what the hell was going on, but I thought that it was, and I'm still I'm standing by that I think it was if six was nine by Hendrix, and uh, just to separate the limbs, you know, doing doing and open up the hi-hat and close it and separate everything he was like this kid is an infant you know and, and he, he, he or he's got it there's something in him so i know i used to bang my head against the seat to music i have these you know slight memories of listening to zeppelin houses of the holy and uh, Loggins and Messina, I liked uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, the trilogy record. I yeah. remember, you know, just they would put headphones on me and that was nowadays, you know, I put my kid in front of the idiot box, you know, and he kills everyone in some murdering Call of Duty <laughs> thing, you know, and back then they just said, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we need to go back here and 
do something fun. <laughs> what are we going to do with the kid? I'll just put him in the rocking chair, you know, and give him, you know, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. <laughs> so, uh, but that was like my start to it. But I, I, I know that I like to take them apart and put them back together. Oh, you know, did you? I didn't really like to play them as much as I wanted to just play with them. So uh, I kind of gave up on the music uh, until I got into high school. I got a kit. And I would just sit up in the attic, you know, and play the songs mm. and uh, really wanted to play sports instead of music. And um, Do you do like marching? Yeah, I did that? do that. I yeah. did that for a few years. Uh, most of the tricks came from the dudes yeah. in the marching yeah. band that taught me how to do some stuff. Uh, so, but that was like, I really got into it heavy when I was probably 18. You know, that was when I was like, okay, I want to be, you know, into music. Mm -hmm. Around that time, were you listening, like Seven Dust is a pretty much heavy band, were you listening to heavy music at the time? I stuff really, I was a late bloomer, I think, on all the stuff that I really like now. The only other band outside of heavy music, because it was predominantly heavy, I mean, like, I would go to all these concerts with my best friend back then, and... uh you know, we would see anything from Iron Maiden to Aria Speedwagon, but really the, we didn't even have to like the band. The, the one band that I really did like that was outside of the hard rock genre was The Police. And then yeah. I remember they played three shows, they filmed that Synchronicity tour, and I was in high school, and uh, I ended up going to the first two shows, and then when I went to school, like I didn't go to school, I, skip school the second day and uh when i went to school the third day which was going to be the third show of that that little you know bundle they were doing there a bunch of kids were selling police tickets like everyone was selling police tickets like i'm walking through the hallway like you need to take us to the concert you know i'm <laughs> like how do you how's everybody selling tickets and they had gone and papered the show because mm. they were filming so and it was a full it was it was in the round, but not really in the round. Right. Like, there were a ton of seats that you were back there, but you actually couldn't see anything. So, uh, but I got tickets to that too. So I went to all three of those shows. Was and that here in Atlanta? It was in Atlanta uh, at the Omni. And then me and my friend went to the Hilton, uh, the Hyatt Hotel, and I met uh, Sting and. Andy Summers. I didn't meet Stuart <laughs> Copeland. Oh, I met man. Stuart Copeland years later, you know, but uh, when I was a kid, I met Sting and Andy Summers. And then we got into that whole thing, you know, where it was like, go to the backstage door, you know, and wait for them to open up the back. And sometimes we'd meet people. I think the first person I ever met was uh, Steve Harris from Iron oh, Maiden. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> yeah. I want to be Steve Harris, but I play <laughs> drums. I didn't meet many drummers back then. It was weird. So Snake Nation is that's the earliest. Uh, uh, that's the earliest band I know you've been in. When did that form? Was that with John John Conley? No, that was with Vinny. Vinny, okay. Yeah. So me and Vinny, um, I was in a chunk of bands before that. Um, like I said, I really didn't know anybody in the music, you know, in the music world when I was growing up. So uh, I went to L.A. I went to MI and barely went to school. Like, worst, worst thing I could have ever done was go from, you know, semi-suburban Georgia, you know, to Los Angeles, California. I mean, I, I watched a guy shoot heroin in front of me and was like, you know, you got to <laughs> be kidding me, man. You know, I mean, drinking a beer underage was going to be like, man, are you really supposed to be doing that? You know, and I got this guy going... Like this, I'm like, what the hell's going on? But uh, I ended up meeting up with some people out there and uh, got to hang out with some people that I liked listening to. You know, I was a little starstruck out there and I did start to enjoy being out there with drinking and hanging out and really not going to school. Uh, so I got out of there. I needed to get out of there, you know, because I was gonna be the 18 year old, you know, that was yeah. gonna fall apart. So when I got home, I tail between the legs. I don't really know anybody that plays. Um, I ended up playing with just some friends, you know, that would do cover songs and we'd play parties. So we'd play, you know, local houses, 
you know, was, hey, I'm having a keg party this Friday. Won't you guys play? Cool. Yeah. So I was playing one of these house parties, and this band Fairchild came to the show. And this is in the late 80s, so its hair metal is at its peak, <laughs> you know. And I had the worst hair. Still do, you know, but I had really bad hair then. And, um, but you got a cool last name though, Rose. I, I mean, it's a pretty cool name, and I, I did something with the hair, you know, to oh, where you? you either love it or you hate it. I mean, this is definitely not normal. But uh, <laughs> the way it looked back then, you know, I was like, here's this big nose, bad hair in a genre that, you know, they want to, you know, puckered lip, real good looking, <laughs> get rid of the nose, get some hair whooped to the right, you know. I was failing miserably, but uh, this band gave me an opportunity. They came to this house party, decked out, fully ready to go, and I knew who they were, and they were one of the first ones to really start playing original music around Atlanta. And uh, so I joined that band, and uh, they were the ones that gave me the start. Uh, Fairchild was Fairchild. the name of the band, which ironically, back then, you know, there was an actress named Morgan Fairchild, and. So people started joking about that, you know, <laughs> Fairchild, oh damn, Morgan Fairchild, you know, <laughs> so, but, uh, so that lasted about a year, then uh, I played a few gigs with another band called Jet Black, and uh, they were more predominant gigs, like they were playing, we were, Fairchild was playing mostly bars and stuff like that, and uh, Jet Black was actually playing venues that, like, Seven Dust plays now, so, uh, I only did two shows of them, they broke up, and then I started my own band with one of the guys from that band called Stiff Kitty. Nice. Yeah, that was that was like, it was gonna happen. You know, we were, I figured somebody could iron my hair out, I finally got it whooped to the right, the right way, they could contour my shit, you know, to where <laughs> it wasn't like way off. And, uh, you know, I started duck lipping and everything was cool <laughs> for a few years, and, uh, and then that, we realized we weren't going to get a deal with that. And then Vinny and me got together and started with a few of the guys from that band and started Snake Nation. And then Snake Nation had a demo deal with MCA. We thought we were going to get a deal. And uh, they actually, it was the end of the year, they gave that deal to Dave Matthews. Oh. So it was between Snake Nation <laughs> and Dave Matthews. And, uh, you know, best decision they ever made was to sign Dave Matthews, <laughs> ever. And uh, for all of us, because I don't think that band was going was gonna to do it. But, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, Did and you then, guys meet LeJean around this time? Or? Yeah, LeJean was coming to shows with Snake Nation. Mm. Like, he would see us. and uh, He was a little bit younger, though, right? A little bit younger, yeah. and, uh, and I liked him. Like, I, he was a nice guy. Um, he... Uh, he was he had this ag aggressive stage presence you know so my thing was when i decided that i was going to leave snake nation vinnie said well i'm coming with you and uh, a friend of ours said you know you should go we were living in this apartment complex he goes you know you should go down to the apartments down there john conley's down there and he's got some songs you know that they're they're right up your alley and i was like john plays drums you know, he had yeah. been signed with a band called the Peace Dog, so I was like, we don't need a drummer. He goes, no, he's playing guitar. So we went down there, and the first song I heard on a little four track was Black. First song I ever heard. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is crazy. You know, like, yeah. I really liked, he was rhythmically the guy, you know. He, he would play drums, now he's incorporating that into his guitar stuff. And um, so I thought, this will be fun. You know, we'll we'll go ahead and just do some demos with him. So me and John were singing on it. It would just be me and John and Vinny. And John had only been playing guitar like a year. You know, I mean, really, like he didn't own a guitar strap at the time at all. So we did this, and then I just had this epiphany where I was like, I don't think I'm going to get a record deal. Like, you know. Yeah, it's not looking too good. It isn't looking good, and, you know, after you have the door slammed enough, you know, you start to get numb to it where it's like, I was kind of miserable in Snake Nation. Uh, I didn't need control, but I needed to be part of the, you know, the democracy. And me and Vinny would be on our way to rehearsals and we wouldn't even talk. And we were living together. We loved each other, you know. 
But we would just sit there knowing what we were going to walk into. We'd be just driving, and we'd look at each other and go, you know, like, you don't even have a deal yet, you know? There's no money on the table at all, and you're already dreading going in to create, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was... That was something that it was it was a good thing. I had that epiphany where I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna get some dudes that I don't care if they're even good. Mm -hmm. Just guys that I wanna go and have a beer with, guys that I wanna hang out with. I live with you, I love Vinny, you know, we were brothers. So he agreed. He was like, you know what, probably not gonna happen, you know, so let's just grab some guys. I'm like, John's the perfect guy. Guy can barely play guitar and he's cool as shit. So let's go with John. Yeah. And then uh and then Lejean was the first person I thought about. I was like, you know, he's he's cool. You know, he's a cool guy. And But he was younger, and I thought, you know, he kind of looked up to us. Uh, I didn't think I could take him from his band, so the deal was yeah. I would manipulate, you know. <laughs> Immediately I'm like, okay, well, but if we take him and the guitar player, then he'll have somebody he can, you know, relate to coming in that he'll feel comfortable. So I broke that band up and stole him and... Took his guitar player. Who was with his him. guitar player with him? It was a guy named Lee. So he played really, really good guitar player, but uh, not really, not really for us. You know, he was more of a progressive guy at the time, which you know we weren't, we weren't into going that route back then. So we did a handful of shows together, um, and Clint was, you know, had still been rain, in right? Still Rain, yeah. and then they had broken Still Rain up, but really they didn't break any of it up they just fired the singer and then called it something else I don't remember what they called it but they did a few shows and I saw the chink in the armor there I was like it'll be tough to get Clint away from his brother first of all oh, yeah. and I was we were friends with all of them but uh, I had my eye on him the whole time because I was looking for the most aggressive one mm -hmm. you know my idea was I want to get guys that are cool and I wanted them to be aggressive. So this was like crawl space, right? Is that the? It was Rumblefish first. Rumblefish, okay. Yeah, and then uh, then it was crawl space, and then we got same members really. When did Clint join in with you guys? I mean, that was because for a while it was just you and John, right? Like, it was me, John, and Vinny, Vinny for a long for a while for like maybe six or eight months, and then we got Lejean and Lee, and that lasted about a. I mean, God. I, it, I feel like it was about a year, mm. and then we had Clint and this other kid that was rehearsing across the hall from us, and we thought that kid was going to join, but he kept kind of procrastinating on it, and uh, and Clint was, you know, somebody that we had reached out to, but we really didn't think he would do it. So I came home one night, and I was living with John now. John, and I think Vinny was living with us too. And I come back and John says, I got some good news and bad <laughs> news. And I'm like, what's the bad news? And he said, whatever the other kid's name was, you know, he, he said he's not gonna do it. And I was like, God, man, you know, we don't have a band. And he goes, but Clint called and said he's in. And I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. So it was a heavy duty honeymoon, you know, like to me, even back then, you know, Clint was the guy. Hmm. That was the one I always wanted. I always wanted to play with him. Uh, so to have him, I was like, you just took this band of, you know, a versatile yet R&B-ish kind of singer with, you know, a guitar player and John that's only been playing now maybe three or four years and me and Vinny. And now you put like this guy that he's got it going yeah, something's on. Like, gonna he's happen. a monster. Yeah. So he joins and we're like, we're gonna take on the world. You know, now it's like, now it's not just friends, now we feel like we got a real band. And uh, first show, uh, we go out there and I, I've only <laughs> told this story a few times and it's nothing yeah. against my uncle because I love him to death, but he was kind of teching yeah. for us, you know, and there's cups on top of the amps <laughs> and he's pouring the, jug of water into the cups and it's just tipping over right into the amps so he's just the amps are just blowing up all over the stage so our first show having stolen clint away from this band that people in atlanta adored them yep. so for him to do that took a lot you know for him to not only leave his brother but the other guys that he'd been playing with for so long um 
I mean, I just felt like this is terrible, man. Like this guy's gonna be like, "Sorry, brother. Sorry, Troy." And so you guys only did like like a song or two, right? Before that happened, yeah, I had maybe not even one. Before you knew it, it was like me and Clint and I Vinny like, on the stage. Who and, was the opening band? It was a Bullhead Clap? Yeah, yeah. You see, I remember those. Yeah, guys. yeah, Bullhead Clap, and and then. Like, we didn't even know what to do, so he ended up going up there, and they're rapping on the stage, and we're just jamming. I'm like, this is a disaster. We're going to make it. Yeah, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we're going nowhere at all. And we've lost the dude that I wanted to play with for so long. So I remember the next day, I, like, I was talking to him, and I was like, man, you know, I totally understand if, I mean, that was a disaster. <laughs> you know, because it was really the show for him yeah. to convince the people that were like, why are you leaving, you know? That we were, you know, yeah. there to show you that we're we're the new thing in town, <laughs> so it did not go over well. Uh, and he said, "Man, don't don't come at me like that. I'm I'm here for the long haul. You know, this we're make a great this. movie. Like they should make a seven dozen movie. Uh, yeah. Hire some actors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need playing your uncle. You have like game. you need like three or four Robert Downeys from the less than zero <laughs> era to do it. <laughs> yeah. So kind of fast forward to your your. First record, you had J.J. French from Twisted Sister producing it, right? Was he produced it or he mixed yeah. it or something? Yeah, he produced it. <laughs> I mean, he did actually produce the smartest thing that probably is the thing that that got us, uh, you know, any recognition. He was the one that, he was actually the one that, first of all, we didn't want Black on the record. Oh, you didn't? We didn't like it anymore. It was, it, we just didn't, we were like, that song sucks. We don't want it anymore. Wow. And uh, he for, he said, that is going to be your song. That's going to be the song that defines your band. We're looking at him like, you know, we're not going to take it. <laughs> we ain't doing that. <laughs> no you pun know, intended. Yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> so, and then he was, actually, I believe he was like, you know, let's come up with an intro or something. And the whole, da -da 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 that whole thing was like mm -hmm. his idea. And I mean, without that, band's been done for 20 years wow. you know well that was a great idea doing that so i didn't love the recording process uh i i mean i i didn't know anything about production or anything about any of that back then um but looking back on it he made the no matter what no matter what anybody wants to say about how great he did or whether he might not have done what they thought he should have or whatever he did do what probably made the band how were you guys like how were you guys paying for all this at the time i mean you guys all had probably jobs and saving up i mean this is a we got signed deal. here we oh, were signed, signed to do yes. that record yeah i mean for we tvt yeah. tvt yeah and i think we did the record for like 60 grand and back then that was like nothing i mean that was mm -hmm. peanuts yeah i mean they were doing deals back then that were million dollar deals you know for new bands and uh, and also, like, I love the story, like, how TVT, uh, I talked to Lujan about it, but, like, they got a commercial, a little info. Yeah, that made us, too. Yeah, that's really smart. Yeah. Back then, I mean, that was, we couldn't get our way on MTV. Um, no matter what anybody thinks, people were buying everything. I mean, people were paying for bands to get, you know, the numbers that would attract everything else. So there were bands that you would see that would have, they'd sell a million records the first week. In reality, they shipped a million records. They didn't sell a million, oh, they shipped yeah. a million. So, um, you know, with them, they couldn't compete with, there was definitely, I, I mean, I would, I don't know, I, I, don't, I can't incriminate myself or anyone else, but <laughs> I mean, I would believe with yeah. my whole heart on it that people were paying people to get certain places, no question about it. And uh, and the leverage, you know, of major labels to an indie like TBT was astronomical. But uh, they did, they figured a way out. You know, they were like, okay, so we can't get on MTV right now, so we'll just buy TV spots. Mm -hmm. So it probably was cheaper for them to do that than it was to buy their way into MTV or, you know, buy certain amount of records to come up with a big number like you need to listen to this band because look at they've sold 400,000 records I mean we sold 311 records the first week I mean I would yeah. always remember that number from the band <laughs> you know yeah. but uh and I think the next week was like 400 and something and I was like who who are those people you know because mm -hmm. we only know like 350 
and then the next week was like 500 and then it was 600 and something and then 780 and then 890 and just kept going. going like that it's amazing though like did they do that with any other artists like it's like you guys are the only no. people i know of you know I, it I, seems I, like they would have worn that out be like if it worked for some of us let's do it for everybody this i don't really remember any other bands doing it i mean i don't if I was somebody back then and they had, you know, an up-and-comer, I would have jumped all over that. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't remember them doing it with anyone, and I don't remember any other bands doing it either. So after this, you guys toured this to death, though, right? To I mean, death. Was, yeah. We owned the longest touring record of all time. And it was funny because not that long ago, I started getting blasted, you know, what is this crap? What is this? This is ridiculous. And I'm looking at it, and it's... And I love the guys, 30 Seconds to Mars, and I'm buddies with, you know, with Shannon and Jared, but they did 350-something shows on one of their records, and that was a Guinness Book World Record. Oh. We did 462 on that one. <laughs> so we, we blasted them yes. by 100 shows. We did 20, <laughs> 21 months on that. Were you guys still friends after that many shows? <laughs> yeah, we were pretty good. We were still pretty good with you. I mean, you know. You were young. And it's, yeah, you know, we were young. It was like, this is crazy, dude. Yeah. I mean, you know. So I like uh, LeJean said that was how many, like, hangovers? <laughs> like 300 something. I'm glad he said it, yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can elaborate if you'd like. No, just, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, but we went out there. I mean, we started out, it was like, you know, I've had three beers today, like, whoa, <laughs> partying, you know, <laughs> before you knew it, it was different, you know, but, uh, yeah. And so when you guys got done with this, you did you take a long break before diving into home? Great question. They said, how long do you guys need for a break going into your next record? And we're like, we'd basically not been off for 21 months, and we just kind of looked at each other like, two weeks and they're like you know all they're thinking about is they're pulling their wallet out going oh my god how much space is in this thing because this is going to fill the costanza wallet you know we're going to fill the the whole area because i mean we had we had probably sold over a million records then yeah and uh with no time off so with two no weeks time seemed like off. two forever. weeks was like you know that's an eternity yeah they were like uh okay sounds great you know we did we needed longer than that yeah but were you guys riding on the road for this thing? No, just, not just, really. I don't remember us doing. And you much guys did this at Longview out there <laughs> at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys did this at Long. Is it Longview? Is yeah. in the right Longview yeah. Farms or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, you, and so, this took. You said two weeks. Did it take two weeks? I mean, two weeks you? of being off. Okay, okay. And then it was like, then you'll go start writing, and we're like, well, we'll do it at home, because then we'll be able to be at home and. I don't remember how long we were there, but the first demos that we sent them, they were like, got to get them out of there. <laughs> you know, they're having way too much fun at home. Let's send them to a farm somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And it was a good move. I think the first song that we wrote when we left was Home. Yeah, it's a good album title, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you guys, uh, and, and also, um, I know we were talking about it earlier, but I love how you have different guest singers on this album, which you don't do for every album. Mm -mm. Licking Cream, you had... I can't think of her name. Skin. Uh, skin, yeah. Yeah. How'd you hook up with Skin? One of the first shows that we ever did, uh, we did a festival, and it was in Somerset, Wisconsin. We'd never heard of Skunk and Nancy, but that was her band, and we were floored. Mm. So I don't remember whose idea it was or how it even came about, but it was. it started to become, you know, I mean... I think in my mind I was like, we need to get some people in here to sing on some stuff because <laughs> we don't we don't have enough material, you know, know, or you know, it'd be nice to get a little help. But Chino was uh, that was like we all a fans wish of list thing, like, big time, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Did you guys was, play any shows with them? At that time, I don't even know if we'd ever played a show with them. Wow. Maybe maybe one. You know, I remember one show we played with them, but I don't know if it was on that record or the first one. But uh, at that time, we didn't know each other, you know. And Toby Wright, man, he's a pretty big, pretty big guy. He's done a lot of albums. Yeah. Were the, you guys friends with him? or? No, we looked to, you know, he did exactly what we wanted. And then when it was done, we were like, we didn't want that. You know, it wasn't his fault. He did, a, he did you know, exactly what we, we wanted him for. But it was kind of a lo-fi record. I think he even questioned it, like, you know, why do you want to, why do you want to sound like this? But we were, you know, big Corn fans, and mm. he had been involved with some stuff with them and with Metallica as well. And it was like, 
you know, we want a big name guy yeah, that, that has the sound that we want. Again, you know, we were so green that we were like, yeah, you know, we'll sound like Korn and Metallica. It's like, no, dude, you got to write those songs to sound like them. We're like, no, dude, he's the producer. He'll produce us to sound like them. You know, it's like, well, I can give you sonically, you know, what you want, but you got to write the songs. Um, when you guys had, like, Denial, when you were in the studio, you, did you know that was going to be a massive song? I mean, it was very catchy. I mean, you guys still play it live to I this think day, that right? was one that we were... We talk about that every now and again. Like, usually we agree that's going to be the one. That'll mm -hmm. be the one that we go with, you know. The last few records, we've kind of, like, given an, up the micromanaging to the label or to the to our manager and said, you guys just pick it, you know. Yeah. But uh, I think Denial was one that we thought that'll be that'll be a fun song. And recently you guys did this from start to finish. But it was... I mean, when you guys first did the album, you ever think, yeah, 20 years, we're going to do this from no way. <laughs> start to finish? No way. I mean, <laughs> minutes after it was done, I was like, well, there won that career. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you guys tour this one to death like you did the first we one? We did like 19 months on that one, I th or 18. I, did, we, I think we did 40 or we did 38 out of 42 months we were on the road. Coming back to I just saw this. J.J. French was on this one, too? Uh, he right executive here, produced that yeah. one, yeah. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, that was that was right when we were parting ways with JJ. Yeah, mm -hmm. was during that. There's there's all kinds of crazy stories that go on with that. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think if I'm even allowed to say it, but I mean, there was <laughs> there was one really 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 rough business decision that we made back then that probably was uh, you, you never know you know whether it would have been the best thing we ever did or you know, thank God that we didn't do it because, not because of her, but because we could have killed ourselves by then. But mm. um, but Sharon Osbourne was definitely going to manage the band back then, 1,000%. What's up with Sharon Osbourne and Waffle? Like, I heard, like... She's the one that named it. She didn't even she, know she named it. Okay, talk about that. What was that? Well, we were talking about someone in particular that we were worried was going to come after us and that was semi-threatening us and she said and we were writing that song at the time and i was talking to her on a payphone, you know because we're old as dirt and there was no cell phones <laughs> do you have a pager too? we uh, we did have a pager too yeah and uh and she said i'll oh, just let him waffle on just let him waffle on and i don't have no clue what that <laughs> means but i laughed about it and i said this song is we're gonna the working title was waffle <laughs> so it just stuck and yeah, then we started doing meet and greets at Waffle Houses and stuff. It was <laughs> real weird. But yeah, she was going to be the manager of the band. And then within the year, the Osbournes came out. Oh, wow. So there's no question in my mind that she would have, you know, brought us into that mix. So she put on hold because of the Osbournes? No, no, it wasn't her decision. We, we actually were told by a lawyer that had no clue what the hell he was doing that uh, we were in breach and could be in big trouble if we had gone with her because we had another prior thing happening and uh, it could have been like career ending wow. was what we were told by this divorce attorney that didn't know jack shit about the music industry and we just were scared. And, and you guys are young too, I mean, you don't we know We were young do, right? and we're dumb. We had no idea, yeah. I'll never forget her asking me, how much money do you want in your bank account tomorrow? And when I said, how about like $1,000? And she started dying laughing and she said, um, we'll make it about 200000 Wow. And there's no question in my mind, it would have been in there the next morning. But, Jeez. so that was a decision that we made back then that, you know, I mean, at this point, come on, man, I'm like terminally ill in the music <laughs> business it really doesn't matter what anybody knows <laughs> you know? what are you gonna do sue me that's why you're on the show yeah. <laughs> so what are you gonna do sue me yeah i like when you guys the, did people uh, are like yes yes <laughs> allegedly throw that yeah i didn't there. put any names out yeah, there allegedly. so uh, i remember when you guys did retrospect and the dvd which i love and I remember when you guys got to one of my all-time favorite albums, Animosity. I remember hearing that crucified guitar riff, and I was like, man, that sounds so good. Um, how did you guys get from here to here? It's, it's, the songs are all stronger, it seems like, in my opinion. These are strong, too, but it just seems like a different level. That was, that was to me, like, that was the defining. The fact that that is not unanimously all Seven Dust fans' favorite 
yeah. record. Thank you. For freaks me out. <laughs> Yeah. Because I'm like, I've had oh heated God. arguments about this. I mean, yeah. I'll I'll get in the argument with them with you. Thank you. you. Know? Thank I'm you. like, how how do you think that record is better than that record? You know, I yeah. just, but that is the beauty of you know individuality and people having different taste and you know I'm I'm just that record was, it took a long time to write it, um, due to us taking a long time <laughs> yeah. to work, uh, but. Where was the studio at? Were you guys in Atlanta during this time? We bounced around a lot on that. We did, um, we actually did a lot of the drums and the bass in Atlanta at Tree Sound. Um, right. And then we did mo uh, basically all of the writing in Orlando. We mm -hmm. basically moved to Orlando for a year and we lived in different condominiums down there. Um, that record, I think, cost a million dollars because mm -hmm. it took us a year. And probably most of that money was, you know, housing and travel and cars and you know stuff to get us back and forth and rehearsal studios. So when you um, when you were turning music into TVT, um, w w they must have been blown away by the music. Did you were you sending them like praise at first, or was there certain songs you were giving them? I don't remember which were the first roughs that we sent them, but they were not blown away by it, and we were freaked out by it. So they kept asking, do we have any more songs? And Live Again actually was something that wasn't completely done. And, uh, but this was like the weirdest thing in the world. Like, so we had the basic tracks for Live Again, but we didn't have some of the guitar stuff. We didn't have vocals for it. Mm. So they spent a grip of money to have Lejean and Ben Gross and his assistant and all of his gear and got everybody to go up to Bearsville, which cost a million dollars, you know, <laughs> to go up there and go and record. Bearsville is really only there for the drum room. I mean, it's beautiful and it's, you know, it's historical, but even back then, you know, you could have recorded the vocals and some guitar stuff in a regular little studio. You didn't need Bearsville, right, yeah, you know, all that. and all that went on our, our bill. You know, like we didn't, again, uh, even back then, we didn't fully, we're like, we're never yeah, going to no, get paid back. Yeah. At that point, we probably sold four million records for them. You know, we should have been making money. We were making nothing, nothing. Mm. But uh, so we're like, cool, we'll go to Bearsville. So then they ended up picking Praise as the single. So then it turns into the guitars are too loud. Wow. And we're like, you know, okay, so we need a new mix of this. So they fly Ben Gross and all of his gear and his assistant to New York to go to Electric Ladyland. So now it's the second most historical <laughs> studio in the United States to do a level change on guitars. Why the hell is he going to Electric Ladyland to do that? The beauty of it is that they were in New York. They wanted to just do it right there. So they went in there and he said, I'm going to check him out and see if this guy has a clue of what he's talking about because I think he's insane. So they did three mixes and uh, two of them had the guitars up instead of down mm -hmm. and then he pulled them down on <laughs> one mix for him. And, you know, that was the it. president said, that's definitely it. And it was the one with louder guitars. <laughs> so, you know, just goes to show you, you know, he had no clue, but there was another probably 30 grand, I think it cost, you know, to do that little move that was opposite of what he wanted. Mm. So. They picked that song as the single, <coughs> and uh, it ended up being the first video. Oh, yeah. And then we had uh, one of my my nephew at the time, who was really young, he had a, uh, one of his best friend growing up. He had cancer, and uh, his name was Cameron, and he was not going to make it. So we did our own, you know, he wanted to hang out with us. So we sent a limo to to pick him up and I think it was Jacksonville and had the limo take him to Orlando mm. and we put him in the video, you know, for Live Again. Oh. So, yeah. That's cool. I didn't yeah. Know that. Yeah, it was really, really cool. Wow. It's awesome. Um, and when you guys did Angel Sum, was were they pressuring you to, because I know you guys did that for a <coughs> tribute. For, uh, yeah, they absolutely for pressured Scott. us to put that on that record, 100%. We didn't want to put it on there, you know. It wasn't mm -hmm. supposed to be, you know. They were, I remember the president being upset that we had given that song. Oh, to know. the uh, straight up yeah. soundtrack. Yeah, like he, 
said, I could have made that a hit. And then he was upset that when in, you know, we even did a video for it in Canada. And, uh, but he was like, yeah, we missed the boat on it. You know, it could have been a hit. Could have been a huge hit. If it was mine, it would have been a huge hit, you know. And I was just like, it ain't about you, dude. Yeah. It's about our buddy, you know, that passed away. Like, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I've got this great song for one of my closest, you Lynch know, that Strait. passed away, but I can't give it to him, you know, because I want to make some money on it. Yeah. Beat it. I remember when um, when you guys put, first put out Praise, I was like, I like that song, but I was like, man, I wish it was like Trust or like Dead Set. I mean, there's so many, it's like all these songs could have been singles, you know? Trust was actually, when it was all done, the assistant to the president said, Trust should have been the song. Oh, he said that? Yeah. Did I'm, you guys want Trust? Me? You know, I don't remember which we thought was the right first single. I, I think Dead Set was the one that we, we wanted to go first. So glad you guys played that, the... Uh, yeah. The reunion, yeah. The home. Anyway. We yeah. uh we played that before the record was out and I mean, again, we have no clue what we're doing. I mean, we're we play the song, nobody knows it, so they don't go crazy. We're like, Man, nobody likes our song. It's like <laughs> never heard it, dude. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. You know, we're like, I don't know, man, they should have weren't crazy, man. You know, they didn't they didn't <laughs> they didn't do anything. You know, we're like, All right. So we we bailed on that song until like a few years ago, we pulled it back in, and it did pretty well. And then, you know, we did it the other night. You guys played this, and you toured, and did the cycle because you guys are pretty. That seems like a pretty reoccurring thing. You put out an album, you tour it, put out another album. You're pretty consistent at this time. It just yeah, I mean, those, you probably new albums out what every every year or so, right? Every yeah, well, I mean, we tour them for almost two, you know, and then... So, after the success of this one, was was TVT going, you guys need to get more more of a pop sound? Not pop sound, but more radio? Yeah, man, you're bringing up all the stuff. It's like, you know, I'm getting, I'm sorry. I'm getting <laughs> this now. Yeah, yeah, I remember <laughs> them. I remember being told point blank, why don't you guys listen to uh, The Hives and... Jimmy World, wasn't that around that kind of time? stuff. Yeah. Uh, what was the other one? The Hives and the 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 bands, you know, the yeah. the bands started to get yes, hot yeah. again. And the White uh, Stripes. So it, it was before them. It was uh, oh god, I can't remember. But either way, the Hives is good <laughs> enough. It was it was one that was like them. No offense to them at all. You know, just we're not that band. Yeah. And um, we were being told to listen to that, and I said, wow. you might as well drop us, dude. Like, get rid of us. We're never going to sound like that. Yeah. Don't want to sound like that. Yeah. Totally respect it. Might even like it, but we're not going to sound like that. And uh, the only thing that saved it was Butch Walker, who had actually recorded, like, a bunch of our demos before we got a record deal, because mm. we'd known Butch for years, you know, since we were kids. He did Crawl Space, right? Some yeah. Some for Crawl Space. Yeah, so a bunch of the songs that were on the first record, you know, he, you know, he produced and, and worked on those songs. So uh, I said, how about Butch Walker producing it? Mm -hmm. And they loved that idea because he was all pop. You know, he was doing a lot of pop stuff. And uh, so, you know, and he did contribute a lot to that record. Like Butch is... He's unbelievable. I mean, as far as like right up to that point, like Ben was the sonic guy. Ben was the kind of guy that would be like, I don't like that, you know, uh, try something else mm -hmm. and make it sound like bulldozers coming through the house. Uh, Toby was the, you know, I'm going to pick apart everybody's personality. So LeJean might sing something that would be flat and he'd be like, it's good, man, it sounded really good. Because he knew the personality was to get the best out of him, you don't need to punch him in the face. Oh, okay. With me, I would play a track where, I mean, I know when it's bad, I'm, I'm the hardest on myself and I'd be like, hear the tape stop and I'm like, that's it. And he goes, worst take that you did all day. <laughs> and I'm like, you mother. And <laughs> smash something in the room because he knew that he would get more out of me being angry. <laughs> yeah. So he was a he was a psychologist. And then with Butch, it was just like, it's all good, baby. It's all good. Here you go. You know, or I got a million different harmonies. I got all this. I got this chord change. Like songwriter extraordinaire. So. Yeah. So, so so Butch was more. Did, did so did he contribute to um, 
having these more popular sounds. Like, I, I love these songs like Gone and Suffocate and Burned Out. Were you guys like happy? Burned Out, he was definitely heavy in on that one. Uh, Enemy, he was huge in on that chorus. Uh, Again, like every song is, is extremely good. Um, your first song, what was your first song off this? I'm trying to think, was it uh, Enemy? Enemy, You guys yeah. still play that to this day, yeah. 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 I, I know those that like didn't go over great in the room with everybody because I wrote the verse part to it, mm. and uh, I'll never forget being told, "Well, Jean don't rap," <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, "Well, then I'll do it." He needs to learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, "Well, Jean, are you cool with this?" He goes, "Yeah, yeah, man. You know, I'll do it." You know, <laughs> I mean, looking back on it, it's like. You know, <laughs> step up to me, step up to me, you know, that, I'm yeah. like, hey, you know, I didn't think we were going to be around this long, you know, I mean, what am I going to be, 60, back there doing a, look at all the that, like like a wise ass, like, God, dude, he's 60 years old saying that, you know? It was cool at the time, though. At the time, yeah. I thought it was cool at the time. I was being warned, hey, man, we might have a career here. <laughs> <laughs> they were all right, I was wrong. So it's been, like, well documented, like, in the middle of this tour around December, Clint leaves, and he goes with um, Dark New Day. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of leaves you guys hanging. And you called Sonny, that used to be in Snot. You've worked with Sonny. I mean, you toured with Sonny before. And we did Angel Sun, you know. For Angel the, Sun, for Straight Up Soundtrack. Yeah. And so Sonny was on board. And you guys kind of, once you called him, he kind of jumped on. And, and you guys were already, had music written for next, We right? were already fully in on that, yeah. So, yeah. Was we that, were kind of prepared, like, we're going to, we didn't really know what to do, you know, so it was like, let's just get to writing. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of that record. You know, that record was kind of like, you know, we got to It was scary survive. times, yeah. It's a, you know, yeah. it was like a survival record. Um, and then when it came time to where it's like, okay, well, I don't want to do the record alone. You know, we need to have somebody in here to do it. Even if we have the majority of the music done, you know, we need to fill this spot. And Sonny was like number one option for us. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want to cattle call people. I've been through being in bands with people that you learn what they're like, and all of a sudden it's like I'm with a psychopath. You know, I don't mm -hmm. want to deal with this. So he was like, he was a family member with us and still is, you know. So that was the idea, you know, let's mm -hmm. get somebody that's already in yeah. the family, you know, to come in. So mm -hmm. the cousin came in to play guitar. <laughs> Yeah, that worked perfect. Yeah. So when you guys did this, but were you writing with, I know you wrote a lot with Clint. Were you writing with Sonny a lot, or did you kind of join No, he came John? in late, so it was me oh, yeah, and John. Yes. I went down and stayed in Orlando for a few months, and uh, I was actually staying at Johnny Damon's uh, lake house, and John lived around the corner, so I would go to the lake house, and then, you know, during the day, I would go over there and work with him, and... Uh, so we came up with a lot of it there, and then we recorded at uh, the old guitar player from Matchbox 20's house. He gave us his house, oh, cool. and then we recorded that record there. Oh, that's cool. I never knew that. It, yeah. was, it was probably the most miserable, like, six weeks I've ever had in my life, ever. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they had animals there, and when they took them all out, they left the fleas there. So oh. it was like, you know, sleeping everywhere you went, you got bit to death, oh, you know, man. I mean, just dying, getting, and the drum room was, I mean, the ceilings were like, you had to, there was, we had to sound replace everything. Mm. So it wasn't the, uh, I shouldn't say it was the most miserable time, miserable six weeks of my life. I'm sure I've had way worse, but <laughs> it wasn't the same recording as it was before that. Mm. I was like, this isn't what I'm used to. This isn't a pleasant, you know, I mean, it's like, so why don't you do, God, man, oh, man, you know, why don't you do, oh God, I'm going to smash him in my nails. I got <laughs> your blood right there. You know, I mean, it was like, it was crazy. It was infested. Oh. You know, yeah. So, but I mean, we got a good record out of it. You know, I really, I'm very proud of that record being that our mindset was, you know, I mean, and you guys aren't with, shot. You don't you don't have TVT anymore. This is a whole new Yeah. That was the beginning of, of a whole nother thing where we had a lot of record deal offers, you know, but it was like, you know, people I think thought this band's gonna be done, you know. They lost the one of their original members, you know. 
and uh, you know he was definitely a songwriter in the band, mm. one of the primaries. So I think that everybody and we had some big number offers, but they were really bad on the the number side. You know, mm. the minute that you got that advance, it was like you're never going to get paid again, mm. and uh, and then we didn't really know, you know, what they would do for us. I mean, they we had loyalty then, and we didn't even realize it. You know, mm. our our supporting cast, you know, of people are so loyal that it's like, with the exception of really phoning it in, you know, I think we could do this for a while. Like, I mean, I'm on the back nine of life as it is. <laughs> you know, I don't mean, yeah. I don't know how much, lo I think I'll be able to finish out my life doing it as long as I want to do it because mm. of the the support, the loyalty, and the love that we have for each other, you know, in supporting us for this long. So we didn't know Absolutely. that then. Uh, so then our manager at the time, who I won't name his name either, but he was a horrible crook. Um, he, uh, he came up with the idea that we could go and do a deal with, uh, well, actually that record was with an up, upcoming label and uh, they gave us a decent amount of money and then they folded within the first like two weeks of the record being out. Mm. So that, that really hurt us. So, okay, so kind of going through these. Um, Alpha was your next. No samples or anything. This was just a, a straight up brutal yeah. album. Yeah. No samples or anything. Did, did you, I say samples, I don't know. It didn't have like, it was just programming. Programming, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we didn't do a lot on that. Was that a group decision doing that? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't even remember what we were, because we do make a lot of decisions on how much sampling how much screaming how much you know what we want to do but with that record it was like i was losing my mind so i was like i'm gonna write a bunch of words and lejean is just sitting there like great you know mm. like i'm gonna have to sing about this nutcase you know oh, okay <laughs> so i just wrote a bunch of lyrics about what i was going through i had a really i had a lot of tough personal stuff going on so um, yeah but we burned through that record pretty quick, and I'm really proud of that one too. Confessions of Hatred. That's a. Have you ever played that live? Is that no. to this day? That's no. No. There's a bunch of songs we haven't played live. The one on the off of that record that we really want that I, I think we all really want to do that we haven't done is Burn. Oh, cool. But uh, and there was talk of doing it on the next run. We talk about a lot of stuff that never happens, you know. <laughs> I think we've talked about Burn like 20 or 30 times. Man, Burn would be really cool. Yeah, man, let's work on that. <laughs> let's get on Never that. do it. Um, going on Hope and Sorrow, this, like, if, I always think of a seven- So anyway, cold day memory. Yeah, so no, anyway. just kidding. <laughs> <No. laughs> yeah, that was good. That was a tough one, Well, man. the question is, is like, this is a brutal album, and yeah. then this is not a brutal album. I mean, this is a, uh, there's heavy songs on here, but if, 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 if a fan never heard of you guys, and he picked this album. I go, yes. If that was our first record, you know, the <laughs> second one would have been a tough sell. You know, <laughs> and um, this your last album was Sunny too. So it, it was. You know, not to jump into that, but it was. You guys recorded this. It really this. didn't have. I mean, Sunny. It, it absolutely was definitely not Sunny's fault. Um, and you know, I'll, I'm sure inside my band, I'll get arguments about it. And there are moments on this record that I really like, but. Um, that was just, you know, the primary riff writers out of the band are John and Clint. And John had a pile of, of ideas, you know, that we could we could exploit on the records before this, on, uh, wow. on Next and on Alpha. Yeah. And when we got to this, it was like, dude, we're writing records really fast. Like, we're knocking records out once a year. Yeah. At this point, it's once a year. You know, it's like, write a record, tour it for, you know, eight or nine months, write another record right away. And it's like, we have no time to even, like, see the, ab absorb what's going on in our life. And uh, so that was when, when we finished with this, I looked at John and I was like, I want Clint back. You know, like, he's, he's good. He's available. I want him. Mm -hmm. I need him. You know, like I need him to be part of this again right now, because it was like, you know, we had tapped in. I mean, I think that if we would have had time, it would have been a different record. And like I said, there are moments on there that I really like, but overall, 
you know, I'm not going to mince words. The record is definitely probably the the least, you know, in my eyes, it's my least favorite of the bunch. When you talked to John, did you were you talking to LeJean too? I mean, was this like a kind of a oh, good yeah. thing? Like, oh, yeah. That you guys all yeah, could tell. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was telling all of them and, you know, and we hadn't had that much contact with Clint at the time. You know, at the time it was like I was talking to Clint, mm. but some of the guys hadn't. I know LeJean said he ran into him one time on accident, and he could tell then. Yeah. Um, so when um, when Clint comes back into the band, Cold Day Memory, this could be like my third favorite seven. I mean, this album is super strong. I love the the documentary you guys did around this album. I, I think it comes with the CD or something. Yeah. Amazing, you know. I was a train wreck on that record. For oh, sure. yeah. Handlebars. I remember you saying like handlebars. Yeah. You, one a day. Queen of Chicago or something? Can't queen. Oh, Queen. <laughs> <laughs> like, the king. Sorry, man. I the mean, at, at times, I probably was. <laughs> you, you had a wig. I, I had that <laughs> thing, yeah. I mean, definitely with that, that onesie. <laughs> oh, man. It was Chicago, was, though, right? That's right. Yeah, I was the I king of Chicago. LeJean said, when we leave Chicago, is he still going to be the king? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I queen? did. I went back there, and I reclaimed my crown. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah, it was, that was a... And I love how the building wasn't even finished, you know, like... Yeah, yeah. that was probably my second mopping next miserable to six <laughs> weeks. <laughs> yeah, if you had to pick between getting eaten up alive... Yeah, having... I would have rather that one, but I mean, it was, yeah, it wasn't the best. <laughs> but yeah, great album, great songs. I, uh, man, I love that first, I don't even know, the first song you guys, Forever. What, I remember hearing, I think that's when you could hear Clint singing one of the verses. Yeah. I believe that's the song. I was like, oh, Clint's back. And I yeah. remember like it was like MySpace days when when you guys were like posting pictures and it would have Clint in the picture. I was like, oh, yeah, man, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, he actually joined like before we toured the Hope and Sorrow record and we couldn't get through touring that record fast enough. It was wow. like he didn't have anything to do with the record. So it was like we're releasing the record and he's here doing the meet and greets and he didn't have anything to do with it. And we wanted to get him in the room. You know, it was like, it's, I we remember that. You guys played going. at Best Buy, like for your release part was there. I remember that. Yeah. 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 Really cool. Um, moving along, you guys did Call Me No One. Great album. So you played drums with, uh, with Clint on this one. What was it like recording this? Just doing something easiest, separate? Easiest, easiest record no I ever No pressure, did. just fun? It was fun. It was easy. It was, you know, we had a great time doing it. That was like, probably my favorite just hang time doing a record of any kind you know was was that and it just comes from you know less chefs yeah you know i mean has zero to do with with john lejean and Vinny. as far as i mean those guys are my blood it was just if it was john and lejean it would be their favorite you know i mean if you only have two guys that are contributing that are in there it's it's easy and so when you got done with this, you guys, seven of us went back to the studio and did Black Out the Sun. I love that you guys have vinyls too, by the way. This is <laughs> yeah. Very cool. I love this album. I love, uh, the first song that sticks out to me is Till Death and hearing Clint's like growl. And I love how you guys almost compete, you know. You yeah. Have the, you have the, like the scarecrow kind of like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the high one. And yeah. he does the guttural one that all the kids are calling it. Guttural, is that Gut what it is? Is that it? <laughs> yeah, like, I don't understand that one, but he does it good. <laughs> this is a great album because it's like kind of like heavy and melodic all mixed in that was another one where it's like when we did faithless i was like this is going to be our opener for the rest of our career <laughs> and then we did it we played it live and no one cared and i went <laughs> damn it was like dead set faithless out uh. you know i mean but inside is a great opener. I mean, I inside know actually I, did I, really well. I love that opener. We yeah. might pull that one out. What was that on? That was on Hope and Sorrow. Your favorite album. See, See? there you go. There were moments. <laughs> there were moments on there that were good. Um, so you guys did a acoustic. I know you guys did acoustic back uh, a long time ago in Athens, around South 2003. Side, yeah. I love that. Yeah, but you guys decided to go actually in the studio, right, and do a couple originals and do. Remakes, you know, I know Gone and Denial and Trust, and was this a group decision? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I don't even remember what the idea was, uh, why we did it. I know that we we realized that going from there to here, we needed some sort of a buffer because 
we didn't want to keep knocking records out every 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and you guys around the time, weren't you going to do like a live DVD around that time? Too? Yeah, there was somebody that was set up to do it and we were even talking about it. We were even letting it get out to the public that we were going to do it. Yeah. And uh, someone else had already done it and we were told, you know, don't go there. Mm-hmm. Like, don't do it. And uh, so we backed out on it. I mean, in this whole... When you're talking about from alpha to here, you know, you're talking about really us being a completely independent label and owning our own. Seven Bros, is that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's really just a name. I mean, we're not putting, we have another entity that is distributing the record, but at at that point, it's like, you're competing with all these other labels that are like actually putting money into promoting things and pretty large numbers. And with us, it was kind of like, we're just putting the record out, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you know, semi-small radio budget, very small marketing budget, no support on the tour end at all. We just, we were winging it for like a decade. No question, Mm -hmm. longer. You know, and I don't want to like no, jump, jump ahead, ahead of you, no, but too, yeah. after that is when things changed. After Kill the Fall is when things changed. Yeah, well, that changed because you know we ended up getting a Grammy nomination on that, and yes. that that helped change things a little bit. Because I thought that would that be, was thank you, right? Yeah, and I thought <laughs> that would probably be like before that happened. I was like, this could not be the last record we ever do, but we're gonna we're going to need to take a minute, you mm-hmm. know? And then when that happened, it was like, we're free. We're free agents to do what we want. Our contractual obligations are over, you know, in our distribution situation. So let's test the waters. And that was like the coolest thing. It was like this, you know, semi-decent, very nice personality girl that you know has now become 50 years old you know and <laughs> looking in the mirror at the wrinkles and then all of a sudden it's like you know you get on tinder and you got a whole bunch of people that want to come <laughs> and hang out and it's a long it, way man and that was what it was like you yeah. know we were doing you know we were meeting with labels and it was like you're meeting with five today i'm like we're meeting with six tomorrow. I'm like, oh, damn, man, how many are there? You know, and, and they were all great people, you yeah. know. And uh, so you guys hooked up nice. with uh, uh, Rise and did All I See Is War, huge yeah. album. Uh, man, this is, I, I just, your fans love this album, man. I hear I them talking about it all record. the time. It's, this is like my go to record now when I, when I pull up your catalog. It's your newest I one. I like but. it, man. I mean, I really, really like that record. And I, I mean, in a perfect world, maybe we would have had a few, maybe another week or two. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I'm really proud of that record. I and remember sitting like in my car on Sirius XM. They had Turbo or something. They were mm-hmm. playing the world premiere of that. And my wife was like, what are you doing? Leave me alone. I'm sitting in the car. <laughs> I'm like cranked up. Like, oh. There are moments on that so record exciting, that are you know? awesome. You know? I really, that's the first record in a while that I'm like, I can kind of go one by one and I can find something out of everything that I like. You guys have just gotten so much better. I mean, it's just it, every album gets better and better. It's like, how do you top this, you know? Is that like... <laughs> like I mean... You the, go back in. I mean, you, well, you hear the, the thing is, is that like, I don't know if everybody in the band realizes it, but we hear everything, you know? I mean, everybody hears everything. And, and we've always said this thing, like if you want to be an ass, you know, in the bus, the minute you walk out of the door, you have to know you're going to get talked about. Mm. You know, it's just like brothers, you know. It's like, do, 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 what are you going to do about it? Do, 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 do. You walk out of the door, and it's like, I hope that he knows the minute he walks out of the door, it's like, he's such a prick, dude. <laughs> like, and it happens to all of us. We all have our moments. So we notice and hear every little thing, whether it's directly to us or to somebody else. And, you know, you hear the things of, do we do a really heavy record? You know, because we're going, you know, we're going in again for sure. I mean, we're going to go in probably, I think, you can't August or September. This. Yeah. You know, oh, that's great. And so that's definitely happening this year. And I'm sitting there looking at it going, damn, you know, we're cutting into January already. 
I know we're doing a tour, you know, in February into the beginning of March. We'll be off for the rest of March. Then we're going to Australia in April. Um, then I know that we already have a run that I don't know if I can even say. I'll tell you when we cut the thing <laughs> off, but that's in May. And then I guess we'll probably be off in June because we did all the festivals last year, so we're not going to do them this year. Then we'll do some kind of a run here July into August. Then we'll go in the studio and do a record. And then another one I can't talk about, but November, December is already booked for Europe. So, Dang. I mean, it's busy, you know. So I know that we have one more. I mean, it's always, this, is, this is a one day at a time, <laughs> one, one record at a time thing for us. But I know we will. And I don't know what kind of record it'll be. I mean, sometimes, you know, I hear Clint, he's like, man, I'm tired of the screaming thing. Oh, you know, yeah. and I'm like, Are you telling you? <laughs> I'm looking at him going, tell me about it, dude. Oh, like, yeah. I'm with you, you know, and then there are moments where it's like, but, you know, it ain't all about me. You know, it's not all about us. Uh, I don't think that we can really do, I shouldn't say we can't do anything wrong. You know, I mean, you're never going to please everybody, but uh, we're definitely not the same band mentally in it or, or you know, mentally, physically, <laughs> in any way that we were 20 years ago. So I am still kind of pissed, you know. I still do have some venom in me, you know, that, that I get off on, on screaming about stuff. And, you know, so I don't know what the record will be like. I don't know. Maybe the guttural thing will be less and maybe the crow thing will be higher or maybe I'll, you know, chill out by the time <laughs> we get in there and I'll be like, let's do a, you know, I can't make you love me, George Michael version. You know? <laughs> hey, Love Biscuit did it, right? Faith, you know. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, they were, that is definitely. Careless mean, he found whispers, a way to you know, get. Yeah, covered. yeah, absolutely. So uh, okay, so uh, last thing, um, real quick, I got a couple of fan questions from your fan page. Your fan page is huge, by the way. Like, I really respect it. It's so cool. The Seven Dust. Yes. Yeah. I mean, people. They're are, they're as loyal. And as seeing they get. them at your your show in the Masquerade. They're is crazy, a, man. Yeah, dude. They're like, I love you. I don't I mess love with you. them that yeah. much. I mean, I do mess with them, but I don't question them. Yeah. I'm like, you guys are crazy. I'm like, I'm like, you guys <laughs> like me, right? You like yeah. me because I like you. Are like, we good? Please like me. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, I got a few questions. My, my friend Paul, Paul Hobson, dude, Paul's a man. He has. Uh, what was the hardest song to write emotionally? Uh. I didn't write it, but the hardest one was the weight. John John wrote the words to that, and uh, I think it was John. I'm I'm pretty sure it was John. It might have been Clint. I don't know, but the music. I know John wrote the music, and I didn't like it. Like I was, it was a weird song to track where it was like, to me it was in three four, and to them it was in four, and I was trying to figure out like, it didn't make any sense to me. So actually. Like I would run my clicks playing it in three and then they would just have a straight four. It was really <laughs> weird. So I was like, I don't even care about this song. Like it ain't gonna make the record. Oh. And uh, so I went into another room to work on something else and I came back and people were walking out of the control room and they're like wiping their eyes. I'm like, what's all this? You know, and went in there and like I almost fell apart the first time I heard the first run of it. And then we went out and did the acoustic tour and my drum tech got to the point where he would just leave the towel at, you know, right next to me because it was like, I can't even play it. You know, the, the words to that song are to me, who is definitely a music fan that has listened to a billion different ways or a billion different versions of losing somebody. And we've written a few of them ourselves. That is to me like the most hardcore, worst, you know, deepest, heaviest one that I've ever wow. been a part of. Yeah, that's a great answer. That, that means a lot, man. That's really cool. Okay, the second question, and I think you answered this already, but your boy Jay Wright. Yeah. <laughs> he put, ask him about a few past bands, Fairchild and yeah. Stiff Kitty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We already hit What's up with all. Stiff Kitty? Stiff Kitty was the one. That was the one with the hair whooped to oh, the right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, I got to send yeah. you a picture of that, dude. I, I got want a Stiff Kitty t-shirt. That would be cool. Uh, 
put on I wish eBay I had or something. One. That would be the best. <laughs> yeah. Have we had t-shirts. This is Stiff Kitty. Stiff Kitty. Watch it. Morgan Rose from Stiff Kitty. Oh, man. How cool is <laughs> that? Back then, it was the best. <laughs> Okay, I was way more popular back then. <laughs> just for the record, <laughs> uh, Kevin Miller, who's sitting over here, he wrote uh, personal taste. What music do you prefer to listen to? Yep, yeah, we we're talking about it. I mean, I like to listen to sad music. So, I mean, it depends on the the situation. I mean, if uh, but most of the time, it's it's definitely more in the Depeche Mode, Massive Attack. Uh, you know, yeah, it's know. It, I've I've drifted back. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, but there there are some some cool new bands that I listen to. But I mean, mostly it's that the heavy stuff that I listen to is I mean, God, lately it's been predominantly Australian, mm. where it's like either North Lane or uh, God, uh, the other one that uh, Dead Letter Circus. You know, Carnival. Mm -hmm. Like I'm crazy about what's going on when in the water over there parkway drive you know just but that's when i want to you cool. know like punch myself in the face <laughs> and you know dead letter circus and carnival not so much i mean as far as the aggression but i mean it's they have the no choice if it, it falls into that world that's cool last question from chris roman but it, it, pronouncing his last name was difficult for yeah me. yeah Ramon. 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 Yeah. Ram yeah. <laughs> um, okay. My question for Morgan is this. After doing this, playing drums for well over 20 years, what goals do you have left? One as a band member and two as a person. Oh. Uh, the band member, I mean, I, we talk about it every now and again where I'm like, I mean, what is, what's the goal other than just to write the best music that we can? I mean, we're not going to be Metallica, you know? I mean, nobody's going to wake up tomorrow and go, that's an overnight success. <laughs> or, oh, there's the song. We've been waiting 21 years, you know? They finally wrote the song, yeah. you know? Um, we have, like I said, that loyalty. I mean, it's a family affair with us and the people that support us. I mean, I don't call them fans. Um, it seems degrading to me. I, I don't, I look up to the people that have supported us. You know, I look at it like, Thank you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so just trying to do something that is, you know, I want our integrity to stay intact, and I don't know whether we don't want to do the same record. So as a musician, I don't want to do the same record. It's, it's that tug of war where it's like, do you give everybody what they want, or do you look at them and go, well, we're together, so if I want to veer that way, I think that's Clint's mentality of, we do, we don't have to do this again. Like, mm -hmm. we can go way that way yeah and they'll be like whoa you know i mean at this point if if nobody really follows and loves that record they know we're only going to play one or two off of it anyway <laughs> True. you know so we'll be playing face to face uh. and all that again but uh on the personal side i mean i just want to survive it mm -hmm. you know my body is broken uh you know it's it's breaking down more and more, and I'm starting to get into a few different things, you know, to keep myself intact. But I'm realizing that it's like I play pretty hard, you know. I like to think that there's like me and two other guys in the in the world that are our age that play this hard in the world, you know. Doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. You know, I definitely don't mean, yeah, man, it's, gr we're the best by any means. I mean, I just think that we play harder and have done it for longer than so many people that I'm like, I don't know much, I don't know how much longer, you know, my body will be able to withstand that. And there's really nothing, it's not a show, you know, to me, it's not like I sit backstage and go, oh man, I gotta, I gotta get ready to do that move you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, and yeah. play with that. You know, it, it just happens, you know, the lights go out, that happens, yeah. it That's just awesome. happens. Mm -hmm. And there's no, I mean, I've had my mother begging me, just take it easy, you know, I'm like, okay, mom, and then <laughs> lights go out and it happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been nights where I'm walking to the stage and I'm like, is that Chinese place like open next door? You know, when we're getting done, I mean, you can hear the chanting <laughs> going on. 
and I'm talking about what kind of food I'm gonna That's eat. It's funny you say that. I've heard Don Henley, I'm just throwing this out there from Eagles, say the same thing. Yeah. It's like he's thinking about what he's gonna be doing later on that yeah. night, you know? Yeah, it's like it's not, the adrenaline isn't the same, but the minute that the lights go and it goes like that, you're like, it goes from, yeah, man, and it's just like, it locks you in, you yeah. know? So then the walk from the side to the drums is like, you know, my eyes are that big and my hands are like that. And I'm like, I just can't wait to smash everything in my face, wow. you know? And that's, it's never changed. I mean, that moment has never changed. So I just hope that I hold up. <laughs> Morgan, dude, thank you for being on the show, brother. Thank you for having me. Blessing, dude, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.